So look in Acts chapter number 2. And uh, I'll begin reading in verse number 36. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know. So again, over and over, we've stressed that in the beginning of the book of Acts, it's Peter, uh, the apostle to the circumcision, and he's preaching to the nation of Israel. He's preaching to individual people, but he's preaching to them corporately. Uh, for instance, Paul says, uh, blindness in part has happened to Israel. And he's talking about the Jews as, as a group. And Peter here is addressing them as a group. Let therefore all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So we talked about this last week, but this is so important, I don't want anybody to miss it. Peter's message is this. This man, Jesus, that you crucified is the Christ. He is the Messiah. And we looked at two places last week. Let's go back and look at them again. And uh, the first one would be in Matthew chapter number 16. And uh, the Lord asked, who do people say that he is? Who, who, who's everybody saying I am? And they give all their different answers. And then in verse 16, Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. Now, if Jesus wasn't the Christ, if he isn't the Messiah, he's the biggest blasphemer and the biggest liar in the history of the world because he, he'd just be a total imposter. But he's not. And he's admitting here that he is the Christ. A lot of times when the Pharisees and the scribes, and, uh, he would play with them. They'd say, tell us who you are. And he'd kind of you know, go around the barn a little bit. But here with his own, he's, he's right up front. Look over in John chapter number four. And again, I hope you could show these to people because there are people that believe Jesus was a good man. They believe he was a teacher, believe he was a prophet. The Muslims believe he was a prophet. He's one of their 10 prophets, but they don't believe he's the son of God and they don't believe he died on the cross. They do believe he's coming again, which is pretty amazing. That's more than a lot of other people believe. So in John chapter number four, Jesus says in verse 24, God is a spirit, capital S, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. When we think of a person, we think of a human being. The Holy Spirit is a person, but he's not a human being. So you had to kind of think a little bit. The woman said unto him, I know Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. So Daniel talked about the Messiah being cut off. But the Old Testament word, the Hebrew word Messiah and the word Christ are the same. And that word Christ means the anointed one. And uh, she says, I know the Messiah is coming. And uh, when he has come, he'll tell us all things. He'll straighten us all out. Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. So here again, without any doubt about it, he claims to be the Christ. He claims to be the Messiah. So go back with me to Acts chapter 2. Do we have those um, boards um, talking about transition? I don't know who I'm talking to back there because I can't see for the... Um, yeah, okay. Um, we talked about the Acts being a transition. Think about it as a bridge to get you one place to the other. And um, so one of the places, look in Matthew. I spoke about this a little bit Sunday night. Look at Matthew 26. In Matthew chapter number 26. And 
Look at verse 25. Matthew 26, 25. Then Judas, which betrayed him, answered and said, Master. Judas never calls Jesus Lord. He calls him Master. Now, Jesus is our Master. He said, you call me Master and Lord, you do well, over there in John 13. But he's not just my Master, he's my Lord. Amen. And uh, the new versions... Talk about the thief on the cross said unto Jesus, remember me. He didn't say unto Jesus, remember me. He said, Lord, remember me. And we had to believe that Jesus is Lord. Amen. And there's something called Lordship Salvation, which I'm not teaching. But I am teaching the Lordship of Christ because he is Lord. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread. And he blessed it. And he broke it. And he gave it to the disciples. And he said, take, eat, this is my body. So now he's celebrating the Passover with his disciples. He says, with desire, I've desired to eat this meal with you. But now he's implementing something new to the Passover. And what he's implementing is the New Testament. He says, take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and he gave thanks and he gave it to them saying, drink ye all of it for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the mission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. So this is the first time New Testament's been mentioned. And it's the night before the Lord is going to die. So if you remember, we said that the testament is not in effect until the death of the testator, Hebrews chapter 9. So Jesus is living his life as an Old Testament Jew living under the law. He's not living his life as we are Christians under grace. So there, there's a difference there. So here's the first time he mentions that idea. Now, one of the things that we uh, switch over to, the transition, is Old Testament to New Testament. I don't know if we put one of those up, did we? Do we have Old Testament to New Testament anywhere? Okay. Well, just imagine where it says Israel, you'd say Old Testament, and where it says church, it'd be New Testament. So we are under the New Testament, we're not under the Old Testament. We're under grace, we're not under law. But grace is everywhere in the Bible. Nobody's saved outside of grace. So give me the one that says kingdom of heaven to kingdom of God. Let's look at that. All right, so the gospel of the kingdom versus the gospel of the grace of God. In the book of Matthew, the kingdom of heaven is mentioned, I believe, 32 times. I counted it three times and I got three different numbers. Uh, but I believe it's 32 times. And that's the only place where the gospel of heaven is mentioned. It's not mentioned in Mark or Luke or John. So why is it so much in the Gospel of Matthew. Well, Matthew is the most Jewish gospel, and Matthew deals with Jesus as the king of the Jews. All right? Over in Matthew chapter 2, the wise men come and they say, where is he that is born king of the Jews? Because we've seen his star in the east and we've come to worship him. So even after the Lord is crucified, in the beginning of the book of Acts, where we are now, the kingdom is still being offered to Israel. It's not offered to anybody else but Israel. Now, salvation is offered to everybody, but the kingdom of heaven is offered to Israel. So let's look at a couple verses. Um, Paul said, if any man preach any other gospel, let him be accursed. So... What he was saying there was, if any man preach any other gospel, 
in this dispensation, the dispensation of the grace of God, it would be the wrong gospel. Now, Jehovah false witnesses don't have a church, they have a kingdom hall. Anybody ever get mixed up? Any, how many people ever talked to a Jehovah witness? They have a kingdom hall. And they don't believe people are going to heaven. They believe they're going to be right here on the earth. And there's, they have some truth, but their truth is confused. But their whole idea has to do with the kingdom. So what is the kingdom of heaven? If they're preaching the kingdom of heaven is at hand, what is the kingdom of heaven? Look over in Matthew chapter number 3. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. We've looked at this verse many times. Over in 417, from that time Jesus began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now what does that mean, the kingdom of heaven is at hand? Well, I mean, it's, it's, it's ready to be established. And the reason for that is because the king is at hand. The king is at hand. And Jesus is the king over that kingdom. In Matthew chapter number 10 and verse number 5, he tells his disciples, Go not in the way of the Gentiles in any city of the Samaritans, enter not, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And as you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. So again, this kingdom of heaven is being offered exclusively to Israel. And when the Lord does come back, now the kingdom of, the Lord's kingdom will be established. After the rapture, after the tribulation, we'll have the kingdom age, we'll have the millennium, and that kingdom of heaven will be established on earth. Now, the kingdom is here right now, but the king isn't on the throne. David, David's throne, God made a covenant with David, Jesus is called the son of David. And God promised him that somebody would sit on his throne forever and ever. And of course, that somebody is the Lord. So what is the kingdom of heaven? Let me read you what I wrote down. A literal, visible, physical kingdom on earth. Men control this kingdom, beginning with Adam and ending with Christ. So the kingdom of heaven is a literal, visible, physical kingdom. Physical kingdom all right go back with me to genesis genesis chapter number one and look at verse 26 if you can't find out you're in trouble god said let us make man in our image notice he doesn't say let me make man in my image he said let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and the cattle, and over all the earth, and every creeping thing that creepeth on the earth. So notice the word there. Let them have dominion. Dominion over the fish and the fowl and the creation. So God gives man dominion. And man, look at verse 28. God blessed them. God said unto them, be fruitful, male and female, and multiply, replenish the earth, and subdue it, and have dominion. Here he repeats it. Over the fish, the fowl, everything that moves upon the earth. So Adam is actually the king of the kingdom. The earth is his kingdom. But Adam forfeits that kingdom when he sins. And now Satan is the prince of this world. Now the Lord is still sovereign. The Lord is still in control. But for all these years, the kingdom of heaven has been corrupted. Look over in Matthew chapter number four. Matthew chapter number four. And the Lord is being tempted of the devil. He's led up of the Spirit, by the Spirit into the wilderness. And look at verse 8, Matthew 4, 8. Again, the devil taketh him up into an exceeding high mountain 
and show with him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. Now, what is he showing them? He's showing them an earthly, physical, visible kingdom. All right? And he says, all these things will I give thee if thou wilt fall down and worship me. Now, if Satan didn't have them in his power, he couldn't give them away. You can't give somebody something you don't have. So Satan is the prince of this world. David's a picture of Christ. David was the anointed king, but Saul was still on the throne. And the Lord Jesus is the anointed king, but in a sense, Satan is still controlling this world. And he gives it to whoever he wants to give it to. And there's been a lot of people and have been his pawns. So, the kingdom of heaven is a literal kingdom and there's lost people in the kingdom. The kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. The kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom and there's no lost people in the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of God is not a literal, physical, visible kingdom, but it's a spiritual kingdom. And it's an unseen kingdom as far as it's inward and not outward. Amen. So turn over with me, Luke chapter 17. Now there's a lot of similarities between the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God, but they're not the same. All right? We're, they're not the same. And now, in, in, in the end, the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God will be one. Right now, the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are running parallel. But one is a physical kingdom, one is a spiritual kingdom. So there's people in the kingdom of heaven that are not in the kingdom of God. Luke 17, I hope I make this clear, it's hard. Verse number 20. And when he was demanded to the Pharisees, when the kingdom of God should come. Notice now, it's not the kingdom of heaven. He's there offering the kingdom of heaven. They say, when is the kingdom of God going to come? They're not the same. Things are different or not the same. Kingdom of heaven is only mentioned in the book of Matthew. But it's mentioned 32 times, which is a lot of times. So they demand it when the kingdom of God should come. He answered them and said... The kingdom of God cometh not with observation. You can't see it. Neither shall they say, lo here or lo there. For behold, notice, the kingdom of God is within you. The Lord Jesus rules in our hearts. Our hearts are his throne. It's not an outward, physical, visible throne. But one day it will be. During that kingdom age on earth that special time on earth. So right now, he's ruling in the hearts of men. Uh, I just got some notes here. Jesus is never said to be the king of the church. He is the head of the church. He's the head of the body. But he's not king of the church. Now, he's king over the kingdom of God, which the church belongs to. In the kingdom of God... There's angels. In the kingdom of God, there's Old Testament saints. In the church, there's only born-again believers. So even though the church is part of the kingdom of God, the kingdom of God is different than the church, is different than the kingdom of heaven. Um, look at Matthew chapter number 5. In Matthew chapter 5, we have something called the Beatitudes. And the Beatitudes, people love the Beatitudes. And these are words of Jesus and they're great words. What are the Beatitudes really? If you take them one at a time, you can use them to teach salvation by works. My message on Sunday was uh, salvation isn't for sale. And I talked about how you, you can't uh, buy your way to heaven with good works. You can't earn your way. Well, in Matthew chapter number 5 tells us how the kingdom will be governed. 
It's kind of like a constitution for the kingdom. And it says, blessed are they that mourn, they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, they shall inherit the earth. So just be meek and you'll inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, they shall be filled. Uh, Notice verse 10. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake. Theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Now there's a clue to you, all right? Talking about the kingdom of heaven. Look at verse 1. Seeing the multitude, he went up into a mountain. And he was set, his disciples came unto him. And he opened his mouth and he taught them. When you see in the Bible the Lord going up into a mountain, usually what follows is prophetic. It's future. So here, it's talking about him going up on a mountain, the disciples coming to him, and then he gives them these these verses and he tells them how uh, the kingdom is going to be ruled. So, look with me over in Matthew chapter number 14. In Matthew chapter number 14, and look at verse 23. When he sent the multitudes away, he went up into a mountain apart to pray. Now, in Matthew chapter 14, the Lord's going to come walking on the water in the storm. And that's a picture of the second coming of Christ. So here's the Lord. And what is he doing before he walks out on the water and comes to the disciples? He's in a mountain apart and he's praying. So what is the Lord doing for us right now? He's ever lived to what? Make intercession for us. He's he's our advocate. He's praying for us right now. But notice this. He went up into a mountain apart to pray. And the evening was come. He was there alone. So that idea of going up on that mountain is is a clue to what is coming next. It's going to be prophetic. Turn with me over to Matthew 17. And I'm saying this to prove my point in Matthew 5. After six days, a prophetic day is a thousand years. A day with the Lord is a thousand years. A thousand years is a day, prophetically speaking. All right? So after six days, is that an indication that we're on a 6,000-year timetable? And the seventh day, the thousand year would be the millennial, the day of rest. The seventh day is what? The day of rest. Sunday's not the seventh day. Sunday's the first day. Anybody out there? If I was blind, I think I'd be here all by myself. (laughs) After six days, Jesus taketh Peter, James, and John, his inner circle. He has 12. One of them is a traitor, and three of them are his inner circle. And people in the inner circle get to see and experience things the other Nine didn't, plus the multitudes never got close to any of that. So it's good to be close to the Lord. After six days, Peter, James, and John, his brother, bring them up into a high mountain apart and was transfigured before them. And his face did shine as the sun, his raiment was white as the light. And behold, there appeared unto them Moses and Elijah talking with him. So again, going up onto the mountain apart is a clue to a Bible student to say, hey, something's coming now that's future. So the Mount of Transfiguration is a picture of when the Lord comes back. All right? So there we go. Let's turn back to the book of Acts. So when we see the kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of heaven is at hand, The Lord could have set up his kingdom back there and where we're at right now in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 1. You remember when they asked him about the kingdom, he didn't say he wasn't going to set it up. Uh, Acts 1, 6, when they therefore were come together, they asked him saying, Lord, will at this time uh, we restore the kingdom uh, to Israel, again to Israel. He said on them, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons. Now, he didn't say he wasn't going to set it up. He just said, I'm not going to tell you when I'm setting it up. So we don't know what year he's setting it up. 
We, we, know, we know the order of things. We know the church age is right now. And we know that then there's going to be a rapture. And we know there's going to be a tribulation. And then we know the Lord is going to come back. And then he's going to set up his kingdom. So let's go back to Acts chapter number 2. I took a lot of time with that. But there is a difference. Things that are different are not the same. Right? So when we see kingdom of heaven, we see a lot of those parables. We'll go over one week the parables of kingdom. Uh, not the parables, but the mysteries of the kingdom. There's, there's, in Matthew, there's all these mysteries of the kingdom. And if you don't understand that the kingdom of heaven isn't the kingdom of God, it's going to be very confusing. You, you won't be able to explain it. Okay? So Acts chapter number 2 and verse 36. Let all the house of Israel know assuredly God hath made that same Jesus whom you have crucified, both Lord and Christ. So he's Lord and he's the Messiah. And you crucified him. Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what should we do? So you remember Paul when he's on the road to Damascus. I mean, the Lord, it just, it just goes right through him. Who art thou, Lord? I'm Jesus whom thou persecutest. So this is being preached not as good news, but as bad news. Our gospel is good news. But this isn't good news because they realize that they're guilty, that they've killed the Lord's anointed. They've, they crucified the Messiah. So when they heard this, they're pricked in their heart, and they said, what are we going to do? Now, they didn't say, what should we do to be saved? They said, what should we do? Because they wanted to be forgiven for what they had done. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the mission of sins. And uh, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. So, in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, is one of the verses that a lot of people really get mixed up on. And if you're not careful, it could send you to hell. So here's one thing we do need to know. And... If we're not sure, and I'm not 100% positive, exactly what this verse does mean, I know what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean that we get saved by being baptized. I know that because comparing Scripture with Scripture, it's nothing, the baptism has nothing to do with me being saved. Um, look at verse 38. Here's how people explain this. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus, for the remission of sins. So if you want to do it easy, you can say the word for can mean because of. I, I went to jail for bank robbery. That doesn't mean I went to jail to rob a bank, but I went to jail because I robbed a bank. So what they will say here is, well, he said to repent and be baptized, in the name of Jesus, for the mission of sins, because you, you have uh, had your sins remitted. You, you have, uh, you're going to get baptized because you, you've been forgiven. Well, look at a couple of things with me. In verse 37, number one, I think this, I think they believe in verse 37. I think they're already believing before we get to verse 38. Because if they weren't believing that Jesus was the Messiah, if they didn't believe they, they crucified the Christ, why would they ask verse 38? Why would they say, what are we going to do? If they didn't believe, they did what they did. So I believe the believing comes uh, in verse 37. And then he tells them, repent and be baptized, every one of you in the name of Christ, for remission of sins. And you receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, we don't receive the Holy Ghost when we get baptized. He told them they would. 
Look with me in Acts chapter 8. We looked at this a couple times before. Acts chapter number 8. Look at verse 12. Acts 8, 12. When the When they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized men and women. So he tells the Jews, the house of Israel, to be baptized, you'll receive the Holy Ghost. The Samaritans believe and are baptized and don't receive the Holy Ghost. I mean, it's it's there. Then Simon himself believed, talk about the sorcerer, and when he's baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen on none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. So Peter says, repent and be baptized for remission of sin, you receive the Holy Ghost. The Samaritans believe and are baptized and they had to lay hands on them for them to receive the Holy Ghost. So which is it? Do you receive the Holy Ghost when you're baptized or do you receive the Holy Ghost when they lay hands on you? There's people today believe in both. One group believes this, one believes, other group believes that. The truth of the matter is you don't receive the Holy Ghost either way. Where is the proof text? Go to Galatians 3. And you ought to write some of these down because we've gone over these a lot of time. But if you don't write them down, you're not going to be able to find them. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 14, that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit through what? One word, faith. In Acts chapter 10... When the Gentiles receive the Holy Ghost, they don't get baptized and nobody lays hands on them. They just believe and receive. And when we believe, we receive. So there is a great difference between, you know, everybody talks about New Testament Christianity. But we got to be careful about New Testament Christianity because there's a transition going on. And there's a change going on. And it's very, very confusing. So, why do they have to get baptized? Well, look at look at um, look at Matthew three again. Look at Matthew chapter three. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So he's baptizing, and people are repenting and getting baptized, but they're not receiving the Holy Ghost. Because nobody gets the indwelling Holy Ghost before Pentecost. Because Jesus said, John truly baptized with water, past, but you should be baptized with the Holy Ghost, future, not many days hence. So, Look in 2 Kings chapter number 5, and I'm, I'm really out of time. But in 2 Kings chapter number 5, I preached about this a couple Sunday mornings ago. We have a man named Naaman. And Naaman's a great man, a mighty man in valor, but he's a leper. Leprosy is a type of sin, so it's like saying, you know, so-and-so is a great man, but they're a sinner. Everybody knows that. So Elijah sent a messenger unto him, verse 10, Go and wash in Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. But Naaman was wroth and went away and said, Behold, I thought he'll surely come to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord his God. Strike his hand over the place, recover the leper. Are not Abana and Parfar, rivers of Damascus, better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spoke on him, saying, My father... If the prophet had bid thee do some great thing, wouldst thou not have done it? How much rather when he saith to thee, wash and be clean. Then went, da- then went he down and dipped himself seven times into Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. His flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Now what did Naaman have to do? What did Naaman have to do? He had to humble himself. 
He had to humble himself. I preached on this Sunday morning. Look at Luke 18. In Luke 18, he spoke this parable, verse 9, unto certain which trusted in themselves, that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up in the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee, the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed with himself, God, I thank thee I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, even as this publican. I fast twice in a week. I give tithes of all I possess. And the publican, standing afar off, would not lift up so much his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, I'm a sinner. I tell you, that man went to his house justified rather than the other. So what was the problem with the Pharisee? He was proud. He was self-righteous. And the only way this man could be saved is if he'd humbled himself like the publican did. So look with me in Luke chapter number 7. In Luke chapter 7, Jesus is talking about John the Baptist. He says there's not a, a greater man than John the Baptist. And in Luke chapter 7 and verse 29, talking about John, all the people that heard him and the publicans justified God being baptized with the baptism of John. So John told them to repent and be baptized. Just same, Peter picked right up on the same message. But the Pharisees and lawyers rejected the counsel of God against themselves being not baptized of him. So we see one group gladly receives his word and they, they, get, they repent and they're baptized. And the other group says, no, we're not going to do it. So there has to be a humbling. You don't come to God proudly. You only can come to God as a sinner. The only way we can get, you know, Jesus said this, and, and I'm almost preaching my message again from Sunday. He said, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So when you see yourself as a sinner, it's very humbling. I mean, if, if you really see yourself for what you are, Peter he says to the Lord, depart from me. He falls down at Jesus' feet and says, depart from me, for I'm a sinful man, O Lord. Now, we know Peter's personality. We know he's a rough guy. He's a fisherman. He's strong. He's tough. He cuts people's ears off. But he's humbled in the presence of God. And his sin hum humbles him. Our sin should humble us. We should get to the point where whatever we'd had to do to be saved, we'd be willing to do it. If you had to jump off the roof to get saved, you ought to be willing to jump off the roof to be saved. I'm going to close here. We didn't get real far. What time am I supposed to close? I've been doing this for a year. I still don't know. I have one minute. All right, go back to Acts. We'll use our minute up. It's like a parking meter. Acts chapter number 2. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one in the name of Jesus Christ for remission of sins, that you may receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now there's gifts, plural, of the Spirit, and there's gifts, singular, which is the Spirit. So when Jesus is talking about the gift of the Spirit, he's talking about the Holy Spirit himself. There are permanent gifts, and there are sign gifts. Some of the gifts, let me say this, on the day of Pentecost, the only people that spoke in tongues were men. You with me? The only, the only ones that talk, spoke in tongues were men. Look at 1 Corinthians 14. Verse 22, wherefore tongues are for a sign. So it's one of the sign gifts. And Paul gives some Instructions to the church. If any man, verse 27, 1 Corinthians 14, 27, if any man speak in an unknown tongue, 
Let it be by two or at the most by three. So if you're going to speak in tongues, never more than three people. The most three. And that by course. So that means you don't all mumbo jumble at one time. By course means if you have a three course meal, you're going to have the soup, you're going to have the salad or whatever, you're going to have the entree, you're going to have the dessert. You don't eat them all at one time. Uh, but if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church. Let him speak to himself and to God. Um, look at verse 34, and I'm out of time. Let your women keep silence in the churches. Now, that doesn't mean women can't sing in church. Doesn't mean women can't say praise the Lord. It's talking in the context, it's talking about tongues. So, Paul gives instructions for tongue talking. It's always a man, it's never a woman. It's never more than three at the most. And it's never everybody talking at one time. Now, if you go somewhere where people talk in tongues, they break every one of those rules. So, whatever that does for you. All right. It's Bible. We need to know the Bible. We need to understand the Bible, learn the Bible. And most of all, we need to live the Bible. Be doers of the word, not hearers only. Let's stand. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed.